statement is, there's an increased focus in privacy of consumer data. Do you guys agree? If you do, raise your hands. Okay, so pretty much 100% of you are. So the question is why? Shout out answers. Facebook. Facebook. <laughs> EU. What specifically in EU? What did we say? EU. With GDPR. Great. What else? Snowden. Snowden, okay. HIPAA. Data breaches. Data breaches. Awesome. Exactly. So you guys hit on all of them. So we're seeing breaches, regulation, and decentralization that are really um, changing the security landscape. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you guys about today. So my name is Madison Kearns. I am a software engineer and developer evangelist at Iron Core Labs. Um, and over the past couple of years, we've seen, we've seen some really interesting trends uh, in the security landscape, specifically around privacy. And if you guys have read some kind of some of my posts, blog posts, um, there's a lot of current, current events in this space, and there's a lot of regulation as well. So let's kind of brief on what the current state of privacy is. Going back to our criteria here, right? So we're seeing that breaches, uh, because of disclosure laws, um, are getting more and more hefty fines, and we're securing a lot more of right? Because companies now have to tell us. And we're also, uh, every, it seems like every day in the news, we hear about a, another breach. Companies are getting closed off the right. And again, the question is why? Well, data proliferates. And essentially, what used to be one system, an on-prem database that used to store all of our data, is now getting more and more complex. And it's getting more and more complex because of mobile, because of cloud infrastructures, essentially two or more in one app. And it's also getting more complex because of microservices and because of that derivative databases. So data that was once stored in one place is now sort of many, leaving a lot more of a um, vector for breaches. So let's say in a little bit. Who here remembers Equifax? Great. Um, all right, so Equifax spent millions on security, but they still lost about, had a breach that affected half of American adults. And I would argue this is because of the high complexity of their system. So they had a lot of disparate systems, and they had scans on a lot of the systems, but the scans were broken. And what it turned out is that they had had 30 points where they could have stopped the breach, but didn't. Okay. And the worst part of this whole thing is, is that it was entirely preventable. Okay, this is my favorite one to pick on, and I can't do a privacy talk without talking about it. Facebook. Seems like every day, if not one, but once a week, if not every day, we're hearing another Facebook uh, breach. And this is a different kind of breach. This is a breach of trust, where they're using customer data to, they're either packaging and reselling, or giving it away, or they're using it for purposes that were undisclosed to their users. So let's dig into a couple here. So when I said packaging giving away data, so Facebook doesn't sell your data, they trade it for more users, right? So here's some examples for you. So Facebook gave away data to Microsoft Bank, they gave away your, your user's friend list, they gave away data to Netflix and Spotify. They gave away data to Amazon. And they gave away data to Yahoo. And in return, they get marketing and more users. And they have similar deals with Apple and Google. So the reason for this is that they consider their partners an extension of themselves, but only as it pertains to privacy policy. All right, 
Facebook location tracking. Who thinks that they can uh, uh, turn off location tracking on Facebook? Okay, no one. <laughs> cool. <laughs> I should have waited to turn this slide. Um, so when you turn off location tracking on Facebook, they stop using your GPS, but what they still continue using is your IP address location. So they still know where you are uh, pretty, pretty close to accurately. And again, what they're doing is that they're lying to the public, they're misleading us, and they're breaching trust. So what we're seeing is that companies are being irresponsible with, with data, and they're undermining customer trust. And as a response, we're seeing a global public and regulatory backlash. And we are the collateral damage. All right, let's go on a little bit of the brighter side now that we took it to the doldrums. Um, all right, so uh, privacy laws, global privacy laws. In the last year, uh, there has been either enacted or passed six major privacy laws um, around the world, including uh, GDPR in the uh, European Union, um, CCPA, California Consumer Privacy Act in California. Um, there's also been privacy laws in Japan and Brazil that have come down the pipe. And there's hundreds more following. Also, there's uh, kind of states are pushing for their own privacy laws based off of um, CCPA and GDPR. Some of those states are New Mexico, Massachusetts, and Washington are pushing for their own privacy laws. And the last is decentralization. So who here has heard of blockchain? Cool. So I would argue that blockchain is really born out of the same ethos. It's trying to solve some of the same problems. Um, now, in, I'm not kind of uh, advocating for the security of blockchain. It's not cryptographically secure. There's hashing, so we can talk more about that. But it is born out of the same ethos, meaning that we're decentralizing authority, and it's a way that we can reconstruct re the behavior of the internet, which is becoming more and more centralized over time. And it also, a lot of people that are developing blockchain believe in the same concepts that the internet was built on, uh, and which is the freedom of information. Okay, so that's all good and great, but what are the implications on you as a software engineer building your apps, right? We kind of talked about the, the whole global state compliance regulation that's coming down the pipe, but this has a direct effect on the software that you're building because it affects the data that you have in your applications and what you need to do and how you need to architect your applications to handle that data. So now we need to architect for privacy. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about kind of in the continuation of this talk. So the three steps that we're going to follow is that we need to analyze what data is in our, in our app and see if these even pertain to you, these regulations, right, and the data that you're holding. Then we're going to architect solutions. So we're going to look at systems and see what kind of tools are available to us to comply with regulations that are being put on the data that we're holding. And then last, I'm going to show you a kind of a quick demo um, of end-to-end -end encryption, which is one of the ways that you can handle um, uh, private information. OK, <laughs> analyze first. OK, another raise your hand thing like to interact. Okay, uh, who here has uh, sensitive informa health information in their applications or the applications that they're building? Okay, keep your hand raised. Okay, who has finance information? Okay, who has any sort of user-generated content? Anything like posts, recordings, chat logs, uh, support requests, anything like that? Keep your hand raised high. Okay, who here has email addresses? Or IP addresses? What about usernames? Okay, this affects all of us because this is the data that, that is protected under these regulations. Okay, 
So data covered, again, here, username, email, IP addresses, location, address, health information, any sort of sexual orientation, and the biggest one, again, just to reiterate, any user-generated content is protected. Okay, so how do we architect for this? This seems like a big, hairy problem that I don't want to handle. It's scary. Okay, there's a couple ways we can do this. And by the way, in this talk, this is not legal advice, but we are going to go through legislation um, to kind of figure out what our obligations and how, are and how we handle this data. Okay? So looking at Article 25 of GDPR, it says that data needs to be protected by design and by default. Okay? So a couple things here. It means that it's incumbent on you as the application developer to protect the user's data in your application. And you need to design your applications accordingly. Uh, I think I put this later in the presentation, but I think it's a good note to make here. As you're designing applications, it's really important to document how you're going about designing, to show that you designed with privacy in mind. Okay, one of the core concepts here is minimization. Minimization means that you're collecting only what you need, only the data that you need, and you're only holding it for as long as you need it. So that means if you are collecting birth dates, but you're not using that for any reason, that's illegal now under GDPR. Oh, this is that where that slide is. Yeah, but document, 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 document everything as you're going through the design process of how you're building your application so you can prove that you built your applications with privacy in mind. Okay, so the then we're going to go to GDPR Article 32, the security of processing. And I can, for the life of me, not say this word. This is what I was practicing all yesterday. Pseudonym pseudonymization. Everybody try it. Everybody try it. Pseudonymization. Pseudonymization. We're just going to call it de-identification from now on in the presentation. Um, so just going back here, um, this is really the de-identification of personal data. And that you need to protect against um, abuse and kind of abuse of insiders. Meaning that if somebody had access to the database, they couldn't tell who each uh, log entry uh, uh, belonged to. Right? Okay, so, the identification. <laughs> um, so this means that we uh, put the data in our system in a way that we can't recognize who a person is. So they could have information about me, but they wouldn't have my name, Madison, in the, in the table. It would be kind of a unique, unique ID, no identifier, right? So this is a way that you can comply with GDPR. It's a potential tool. There are some issues with it, though. So we're going to look at a uh, article that New York Times uh, wrote about de-identification and their process in being able to re-identify the user users from this data. So it turns out that uh, weather apps like Weather Channel, which is owned by a subsidiary of IBM, uh, tracks your location data, de-identifies it, packages it up, and then resells it, okay? Now, when that's combined with public data sets, it's very easy to re-identify who someone might be. And that's exactly what New York Times did. So they uh, track location data of individual, or bought this, this data set, and then combined it, and they were able to pinpoint a woman, and they came up to her and they said, so how was that doctor's appointment last week? How'd that go? Because they knew everywhere she was going. They knew her workplace and her home. That's easy enough to identify you, right? 
So, and then they looked at the patterns, and they said, well, where is she going that's not those places? Oh, she went to a, a clinic. Oh, she stopped at the store. Maybe she went and stopped at an AA meeting at a certain time. It's pretty private information, right? And it's easy to put, it, put two pieces together to re-identify an individual user. And I would argue that it's really not okay. It's not enough. Okay, so let's talk about encryption. So full disclosure, I work for a company and we provide an encryption solution. I'm not gonna talk about that um, today. What I am gonna talk about though is the technique of encryption and how it can be used in your applications um, and what some of the benefits are. Um, okay, so oftentimes when I talk about encryption, I hear like, I've got encryption. And most of the time, it's transparent disk encryption. And before we dig any further, I just want to kind of dig into that a little bit. So transparent disk encryption is not enough. It encrypts data while your machine is off. But as soon as it's on, uh, what's transparent to you is also transparent to a potential hacker. Okay? So transparent disk encryption is not the answer. We're going a little bit more in depth. Um, And then another thing to note here is that when we keep flipping back between GDPR legislation and technology, GDPR is not prescriptive on the technologies that you use or how you implement the features that they're asking for. But they are asking for specific um, capabilities, like logging of every access event, like knowing who's accessing it, right? And there's certain ways that uh, technological uh, uh, solutions to how to implement that. And the truth is, is that they're not going to uh, look at the technical implementations and say, oh, well, they went through a breach, they did everything they could. They're going to say, no, um, if your data is lost, you probably didn't do enough. Okay, so let's dig into some architectures. I'm going to th show you three architectures, and we'll kind of talk through them. If you have questions in this piece, please. Um, ask them as we go through. Okay, so three patterns uh, of how you can use encryption and architect that into your application. Again, these are um, based on public key cryptography. There's open source libraries for these, and you can create your own encryption services. So first, we're going to talk about uh, server-side proxy and what that uh, architecture looks like and some of the benefits of it. Then we'll look at server-side application. Oh, I missed a hyphen. Um, we'll look at uh, kind of the server-side application and what that would look like. Again, some of the benefits and trade-offs. And then lastly, we'll talk about uh, client-side encryption, and this is what I'll demo to you guys as um, kind of the implementation piece. Okay, so server-side proxy. Here we have our device at the top. It talks directly to our application, and then that application uh, talks to the encryption proxy which has access to individual keys that, that it then is able to unwrap and send back to the application. So the application here will say, I have data that I want to decrypt. Can I have the key to decrypt it? Right? And when it asks, that event is logged. First, so Apple, Apple is an access, um, access control list meaning who is allowed to see this data and who is not, right? Let's check to see if the application can read, and then the event is logged. Now, one thing to note here is there's not very strong um, authorization between the application and the proxy letter in this architecture, and that can lead to some potential downsides. Also, I just realized you can't see the server side, like the server block, which is kind of a bummer. But, yeah, okay. Um, it cuts off right after the device. Any questions here? Okay. So, another potential architecture is the server side application. 
And as we've been doing more and more market research internally, we're finding uh, a lot more traction with um, this kind of uh, architecture because it relies on servers that are um, reliantly fast. And so in this architecture, the application will uh, request keys from the encryption service, decrypt, and then uh, be able to pass that back directly to uh, the device. Yeah? Actually, I was just wondering, uh, the encryption keys, uh, would that be something like a JWT or? So, no, they're a little bit different. So JWTs verify identity, whereas encryption keys are, um, they're more private, they're uh, longer lasting than JWTs, and they are the key to actually go ahead and decrypt the data. So if you don't have the key, you cannot like re -audit. you can't come up with it again. It's not backwards, right? With JWTs, you can repass it, right? It's a little bit different. But most of the time in these systems, JWTs are used to authenticate a user. And then that's kind of proving the Apple or proving who somebody is. And then they can go ahead and get the key to crypt. So that's normally how these systems work with identity. Other questions? Yeah, so in the other one, the encryption proxy just has encrypt and decrypt um, uh, uh, functions, whereas in this, it's actually passing the key back to the application, only stored in memory, for a short period of time. So it's, it's the difference in key passing. Does that make sense? Exactly, yeah. Okay, last one, client-side uh, applications. So this is probably the most robust of the three architectures, it, but it's a lot less common. Um, so the device actually has the key on it, and the device is the only thing that can decrypt. Not the only thing, sorry. The point of use is the only thing that can decrypt. So disregarding this for a second, what you have is an application that sends data to the device. The device has the key on it, decrypts the data, and is able to view decrypted data, right? So the client is the only, only user who can decrypt that data. And an audit event happens from every um, single interaction there. But what you might be asking, which is kind of the, the logical next step here, is what if I have a service, a microservice in my architecture, how do I access that data, right? Well, what you can do it is that you can give that microservice a set of keys, just like the client. So when I say point of use, it can be a service as well. You give them a set of keys, give it a separate set of keys. It can decrypt, and every time that that service decrypts, it's logged as well, which is what you need under regulation. <coughs> Questions here? If you can do, you can do a, wrap, a key wrapping technique here, where you can um, pass them an encrypted key that the application never sees the decrypted version of the key, pass the encrypted key to the application, and then the client can decrypt it. Um, but to your question, you know, I think it really depends on the application. So while this is maybe, I don't want to say this is idealistic, but this may be a better fit for a greenfield app, they're building from the ground, the ground up. But in the case of a Brownfield app or something that's already been built before, that you have services that you can be able to talk to each other, retrofitting something like this is much harder. Cool. So what you'll 
you'll notice around all these architectures, and that, that's such a great question, is because it really just it depends on your trade-offs. Um, and but what you'll notice is that there's some sort of uh, separate service, encryption service, that allows you to log the point of access at every single increment, right? So what this is for us is it's an unavoidable access uh, control and audit logging layer that ensures that nobody can see the plain text of our database without going through that layer, right? And that's what's critical for the legislation is that piece because we need to know who's accessing it, when they're accessing it, and how often, and be able to turn it off, right? And so by this having the access control list, we can remove somebody from the list, and they can't access uh, the data anymore, right? Which is exactly what GDPR uh, pushes forward. And same with CCPA. Um, So next piece is a quick demo. Demo gods be on my side. And I'm just going to show you kind of an implementation of the last architecture, just the encrypt functionality, and show you um, that text can be encrypted on the client before it's ever sent to the server. Um, so the server never sees decrypted. Oh, not going well so far. This one, this room? Okay, so what I've got running here, all good, sweet. Okay, so what I've got running here is I've got a React app um, that is using, uh, probably a lot of you recognize that Material Design, it's using Redux, um, regrettably not using TypeScript, and it's connecting to a data store uh, database in the back end. That doesn't really matter. Um, but what I want to show you is the actual request here. So, really good password. Oh, let make sure to do that. <coughs> okay. So, to your point, um, here's the JWT. It's off. Thank you. I'm actually calling the encrypt function on the client before anything is ever sent over the network. So while my message was an important information, it's now encrypted. And when this is stored in the database, it can't be viewed for, in plain text. Does that make sense? And then on the client, I can go ahead and decrypt that because I have the key to decrypt it. But it was also encrypted. Okay, I think we're still doing okay on time, so I'm going to dig into a couple more um, articles in GDPR. So, the another one is the right to erasure, meaning that a data subject or an individual user um, has the right to ask you to delete their data uh, and any data that you hold up. So, think about this in terms of your database architectures. If you have a central store, and only one, that's easy enough to do, right? But what if you have a message bus that's feeding all of your microservices downstream? All of those microservices have separate databases. It becomes a lot harder task to achieve in really complex systems. And this is kind of the, the origin of a lot of the problems that we're running in that legislated, that we're 
it seeing like regulatory backlash on. So, unless you have uh, legal obligations such as tax purposes, um, health um, reasons, you are not allowed to say, like, deny these requests. Right? There is a little bit of a loophole that it's like, well, if it's way too hard, it's going to cost you a bunch of money, you can get through it in GDPR. That's not the same for CCPA. And more legislation coming down the pipe is going to stricter and stricter around what your legal are. Um, but what is a really cool technique here is what, what I call, I don't know, I don't think my coworkers like this term, but I really like it. Uh, it's called crypto shredding. So the idea that if something is encrypted in your database, if you delete the key or you take somebody off the access list, it's still on the database, but nobody can ever decrypt it because the key's gone. So it's a really cool way to handle this. Um, that said, there's also a lot of backup solutions that are implementing this for you. So uh, we're, it, they actually support the right to be forgotten. Um, and they're helping you with access locks. So at the same time that we're seeing regulation coming down the pipe, we're also seeing other tools that are coming and being at your disposal. But it's not really a one tool, this is gonna solve GDPR for me. It's a set of tools and design practices that are gonna to need to be put in place to really, really solve this. Okay, so Article 7, Conditions for Consent. This is an interesting one. So it's, a le it's, it's your legal basis for holding data. And you need to have a legal basis for why you hold data in your application. So you can't just uh, uh, overly collect and hope and be like, well, we don't use it. It's fine. You can't do that anymore. And there's some really interesting tools around managing uh, granular consent. So these are some um, other tools that I've kind of found that are trying to solve this right now. Definitely not, not endorsing them, try them out, but there are um, things out there for you. What they do is that they give granular consent to, uh, or they allow the user to give granular consent to different APIs or services that are accessing their data. Then you can turn on and off and see how it's being accessed. And they also help you manage some of the complexity because there's, this may seem like it's kind of, uh, like cookies, we'll just show, show, accept cookies, right? But it's, it's not that easy anymore. And the reason being is that you need to show how um, to track how you're getting data from individual users, um, how long you have it for, uh, and when you, when you uh, change how you're using data or any third parties that might be using that data, you need to get fresh consent. Right? So you can just kind of stale, stale agreements that users haven't agreed to. And specifically, uh, if you got data from a third party, uh, this can help you track kind of third party agreements, contractual agreements for how you're using data um, and help manage that because it is kind of a, a basic problem. So in conclusion, um, we think that we know how to architect uh, applications for today. But uh, technology is, not, is only part of the equation for us now. And we cannot treat consumer data as a property of the business. Regulation and backlash is putting the, hand, the, the rights of the data back in the hands of the consumer. And that changes how we architect applications. And the truth is, is that as an implication on us software developers, is that we need to be aware of the constraints that we face and that come along with steep financial burdens if we mess this up, uh, and, and reputational penalties. From now until, until the, from now on, um, we need to be able to build our applications with privacy in mind. 
Thanks for having me here. Uh, first question for you. You're okay with some questions. Great. Uh, if I talk to non technical friends, some of my old teaching friends and so forth, about things like privacy, they say, I don't really have anything to hide. Yeah. Why do I care? Should they care? They definitely should care. Um, so, I actually I was watching, what I do in my free time is I watch a bunch of TED Talks. So I was watching kind of this TED Talk and it was talking about exactly that statement there. As to, I mean, I've heard that a lot as well. Well, I have nothing to hide. What does it matter? But what I've kind of shown in this example is that data proliferates and is no longer in the control of the consumer. And so I think that that, uh, that statement is from a government standpoint, saying that the government is going to watch how I'm using data. But what about companies that are reselling that data and then using it to kind of manipulate what I'm seeing, know more about me, um, and see things that are private and they change. If I knew if, it, if I knew it was public, it may change my behavior. For me personally, one that always like uh, that really caught my attention was when insurance car insurance companies started offering you a discount if you install the uh, little tracker in yeah. your thing. And I'm like, hell no. Like, this is not going to be good for me if they're tracking all kinds of my data, right? So, like, even if you're not, if you don't consider yourself, like, a really um, privacy-focused person or whatever, you, there are plenty of examples of how this data can start to affect you in, like, small ways, right? Yeah, that's a good time. Um, quick question about G GDPR and decentralization. So GDPR uh, requires the right to be forgotten. But if someone is decentralizing data like on blockchain, and blockchain can't be deleted, how do those two coincide? Yeah, I know it's a really interesting problem, and it's one of the, the limitations, I think, of blockchain. There are potential solutions with encryption. What scares, what scares me with that is whenever you have immutable logs, as technology um, gets better and better over time, what might be secure today, as far as our encryption algorithms, may not be secure in the future. Um, so I think that's a big problem. It's a big limitation of blockchain. Some architectures that I've seen are potentially pointers to documents, so you're not actually storing the sensitive information on uh, blockchain. Or, in, in the, I mean, blockchain is just the, the technology that we're using, but it's really an ephemeral log, right? It could be any system that's using an ephemeral log. Um, there are major limitations and some worries with that, but if you're storing the pointer to the data, you can still go ahead and delete the data, potentially. There's some architectural approaches to that. Um, so if, thinking about like client-side uh, encryption, does that end up becoming expensive to actually do that encryption on the client side? Does that end up affecting the UI or the user experience at all? in having to do that on the front end and then sending it to the server? Yeah, I mean, there are performance implications, um, specifically with, now this is probably getting too in the weeds, but with multi-hop encryption, when you're encrypting to an entity or a group, and then to a user, encryption operations can get really expensive. That's why I think, um, just from what I've seen, building it in-house can be really complicated. Um, there are solutions out there, third-party libraries, like IronCore is making one actively right now and working on performance issues. We're using technologies like WebAssembly and Rust to address performance issues. Um, and we've seen some, some major, major gains to the point where it's no longer uh, a big cost. Um, but that takes optimization and it takes uh, uh, tweaking your algorithms. So mm, that's not the right term, but finding the places where you can uh, make performance benefits. Um, going off your example, I recently built an application. <laughs> where, where uh, right here. Oh my god, I was yeah. sorry. I was like, it's what? Like, <laughs> um, so yeah, I recently built an application using like the same technologies and we're basically getting a JWT from our back end, um, authenticating the user once they're logged in, and then using it for ongoing um, requests to the database. What type of behaviors would like encryption function have, or a de-encryption function have, um, just in, in how would I be able to test that? 
Uh, it, so it depends on the library that you decide to use, but it would, so JWTs are often used for off, offing, which you just described. Um, what encryption does is it would be another layer of protection. Um, so you could use JWT to unlock a key that can then decrypt the data, right? So JWTs aren't being used to encrypt data that's sent to the server, right? Is that true? Yes, yeah, that's it, exactly. But I was basically like just storing it in like the Redux store, which is not like the most secure thing to do. So I'm just curious, like how I like ensure that it actually is encrypted once I have that key. Yeah, well, um, Based on your example. I have all my code that I showed in the example, which I'm happy to show you. I'm using the IronWeb um, library, but um, it's just, it's it's using the key, like an encryption library to encrypt data on the client. It's, it's different from the JWTs, although it is using JWTs. Um, but I'm happy to send you source code. I'm using Redux and React in that sample app. That's exactly what I'm using. Cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. All right, thanks, Madison.